Some posted health scores, things like readiness, recovery, strain, or body battery, have become a staple of wearables like Aura, Whoop, Garmin, and Fitbit. The idea is simple. You get a single number every morning that supposedly tells you how prepared your body is to train, how well rested it is, or whether you should be taking it easy. On the surface, the concept has merit. Use sensor fusion techniques to combine lots of different physiological signals, things like heart rate, sleep, and activity, into a single numerical score, something that helps you decide what to do with your day. But is this idea grounded in good science? That's what I'll aim to cover in this video. First, a bit of background. We recently published a systematic review of these composite health scores, which looked at all the different companies' approaches to integrating wearable-derived biometric data into a single index of health. For our review, we defined a composite health score as any proprietary measure derived from the integration of multiple biometric signals into a single score that reflects your general health, recovery, or readiness for daily functioning. And these scores come in many forms. For example, Garmin has their body battery and training readiness scores. Aura has their readiness and resilience scores. Whoop has strain and recovery, while Fitbit uses something called daily readiness. And there are others from Ultrahuman, Coros, Polar, and Withings, but they're all doing the same thing, pulling in data from a bunch of different sensors and combining it into a single number. Now on the surface, it sounds like a useful shortcut, especially if you don't want to dig into five different graphs and charts every morning. But here's the thing, the scientific basis for the process for the way these scores are calculated is flawed in a couple of ways. There's also an issue around transparency a lot of the companies are pretty opaque in terms of their methodologies for the different inputs and weightings and how the scores are calculated. What we do know from what they've published in user manuals, blogs, or the occasional white paper is that they all rely on a fairly similar group of biometric inputs. Resting heart rate, heart rate variability, or HRV, sleep duration and quality, and physical activity or training load are the most commonly used metrics. 86% of the composite scores we evaluated used resting heart rate or heart rate variability in their calculations. Some of the scores also incorporate things like respiratory rate, skin temperature, and blood oxygen saturation, but not as often as the others. Okay, so let's talk about why these particular inputs are being used and whether that actually makes sense from a physiological perspective. Let's start with the two big ones, resting heart rate and heart rate variability, or HRV. Resting heart rate is pretty straightforward. In general, a lower resting heart rate is associated with better cardiovascular fitness. It tends to come down with consistent training and good recovery, and it goes up when you're sick, you're stressed, or overtrained. So it makes sense to include it. Heart rate variability, or HRV on the other hand, is a bit more nuanced. HRV measures the tiny fluctuations in time between each heartbeat. It's not about your heart rate, but about the variability from one beat to the next and that variability is influenced by your autonomic nervous system. Specifically, the balance between your sympathetic nervous system, which activates fight or flight, and your parasympathetic nervous system, which supports rest and recovery. Higher HRV at rest generally reflects better parasympathetic activity. It usually means your body is well recovered and adaptable. Lower HRV can indicate fatigue, stress, or illness. So in theory, combining HRV with resting heart rate gives you a solid picture of how your body's doing. And then there's your sleep. Poor sleep, or not enough of it, impairs everything from mood and memory to reaction time and immune function. It also affects HRV, resting heart rate, and how well you recover from training. So again, it makes sense to include it. Same goes for physical activity. If you trained hard yesterday, your score might reflect that your body is under strain still. So these are meaningful metrics, but and here's where it gets tricky, they're all interconnected. And that can introduce problems when you try to combine them into a single number. This is where the concept of sensor fusion that I mentioned earlier starts to break down. Because while it's great in theory to combine multiple signals, if those signals are tightly linked, you can end up double counting the same physiological event. You see, a lot of the signals that go into these scores, heart rate variability, resting heart rate, and sleep, are not independent, they're linked which means if something goes wrong in one area, it usually shows up in the other. Let's say you had a rough night's sleep, for example. Chances are your HRV will be lower the next morning and your resting heart rate might be higher. Those are natural expected responses. But in some composite health scores, all three of those, sleep quality, HRV and resting heart rate, are treated as separate penalties in the final calculation. So in effect, you're being penalized multiple times for the same underlying issue, poor sleep. This kind of 
double or even triple counting creates what's called multicollinearity, where overlapping variables skew the output. And the result is that you might get a dramatically lower readiness or recovery score, not because your body's under stress, but because the score is responding to the same event from multiple angles. This gives the impression of precision, like the algorithm has crunched all these complex signals and given you a super accurate result, when the reality is that the score might just be amplifying the same signal over and over. Now, to be fair, some companies try to fix this by using what's called a baseline, basically your personal average, to compare daily data against what's normal for you. But here's the catch. None of them agree on how best to define that baseline. Some look at the past week, others use 14 days. A few, like Polar's nightly recharge, use a 28-day rolling average. Some weight recent data more heavily, others treat every day the same. And because these companies don't publish the details of their calculations, it's impossible to know how your score on one platform compares to the other, or whether any of them actually reflect what's happening in your body. So should we just ignore these scores altogether? Not necessarily. Composite health scores can be useful, especially for tracking patterns over time. If you consistently see lower scores during periods of stress or after nights of poor sleep, that's useful feedback. And if you notice trends tied to your training or travel or lifestyle, that's great, use that data but don't take the number as gospel. It's not a diagnosis. It's not always scientifically validated, and it definitely isn't immune to noise, error, or algorithmic guesswork. Use your wearable for what it's good at, tracking long-term trends, giving you context, and prompting reflection. But don't let a single score dictate how you feel or what you do with your day.